Hello, all. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to, to our Kendall at Home uh, Coffee Hour series. Uh, today, we, we have uh, Matt Valencic from the Audubon Society of Greater Cleveland with us. Uh, before I, I introduce Matt here and really get going, uh, just a few housekeeping items uh, that I have for us today. Uh, again, my name is Ryan Anderson. I'm the outreach manager here with Kendall at Home. Uh, with me today from the Kendall at Home side is Sue Woiken. She is the marketing and events coordinator here at Kendall at Home. I'm sure you guys have gotten some of her emails in the past about events uh, or even talked to her about registering for this event or future events or past events. Uh, and so uh, we thank you for joining us today. Um, if uh, I'm sure most of us are familiar with Zoom right now, but just a quick refresher. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the programming, uh, please type that into the Q&A or chat. Uh, we will address those at the end. We'll save some time there for those there, but you can type those in throughout and we'll, we'll make sure to address those at the end. Uh, if you like to change the, the uh, features there um, in terms of uh, viewing, up in the top right-hand corner, there's some view settings there for you where you can change either gallery, speaker view, stuff like that. Uh, you can increase size. Matt's gonna be sharing uh, some pictures and videos with us as well. So uh, please uh, feel free to uh, raise some volume, stuff like that, change things there uh, as needed. Uh, or if there's some settings things, please feel free to message either Sue and I in the chat on there. Uh, and then last but not least is the closed captioning feature that we have enabled. Uh, down in the bottom, there's a live transcript thing. If you press a little carrot up in the top right hand corner of that uh, little CC button down at the bottom, uh, you can uh, change either the size of the font, you can change uh, uh, if you want to see it or not as well. Um, but without further ado, I, I would like to introduce Matt Valencic of the Audubon Society of Greater Cleveland. Matt has been a part of the Audubon Society since 2015. Uh, when he retired on it, kind of taken, it sounded like Matt, a, a passion of the master gardener, the outdoorsman, the bird watching, photography, everything kind of rolled into one, it seemed like for you uh, on that. So we're really looking forward to seeing this presentation here, learning some more about birds and other wildlife in this wetland area and uh, everything that you have to offer us. So, so thank you for joining us today. You're welcome, Brian. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and set up the screen while I introduce myself here, make sure that all is well. We are, um, I am sharing sound for this presentation. So uh, if you have a sound button on your computer, you might want to it, take it to about 50%. There's not a lot of songs and, and sound, but you might appreciate a couple of them. So uh, as Ryan said, I got involved with Audubon. Oh, gotta get back here. A couple of things are running ahead of the game here. Um, I got involved with Audubon when I retired in 2015. Um, Brian, you have to let me know too if I uh, my presenter view. Uh, it, it look it looks all set uh, from my standpoint. So. Okay, we're good. So um, I got involved with them because I attended one of their events called Chagrin River Bird Quest, and uh, I met the people afterwards at a gathering, and they were all doing the same things that I wanted to do. I had a degree in forest biology from uh, Syracuse, New York. And I never used it professionally, but I've always been a hunter first and then a fisherman. And then I got into more of the nature things. As our kids grew up, there was no time for me to go out by myself. So I wound up with the kids and doing things, um, always drawing back on my knowledge of the outdoors. Um, and it really uh, sort of morphed into a Boy Scout leader and just always taking uh, photographs. And, and I've always enjoyed the birds ever since college. I saw my first uh, Blackburnian warbler. So those of you who know what that is, that was my spark bird. It got me started. And so I went through life trying to bird when I could, getting into photography later on of birds primarily. And now as if you are active birders, you know that uh, June, July and August are tough birding months because it's the same birds all summer. And so you start taking pictures of uh, insects and of flowers and all sorts of things. So here we are today. I'm the chair of the education committee in our Audubon chapter. And I'm also a member of the board of trustees. So uh, I have a, a great interest in sharing nature with people. I think we, those of us who are out here need to let everyone else know what's here and take them out and really um, share with you the beauty, the wonder and awe that's out there in nature. That's really why I do these talks. 
um, it's education. And the more people know about the outdoors, the more they're able to make better decisions about their own property, uh, their own interaction with nature. And when you get to uh, the voting booth from time to time, uh, maybe you will be able to spare that wetland that everybody else calls a swamp. Um, swamp's a good thing, but it has negative connotations, but um, spare it for the birds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of wetlands here to get started and then uh, segregate out the, the birds that we're going to talk about, spending more of the time on those iconic wetland species and then less time but flying through a whole bunch of other stuff near the end. I'm going to start my own timer here on my watch so that um, I get excited. I talk a lot. So here's a couple of quick videos of a wetland. This would be the first one. You can hear the blackbirds in the background if you have volume. Those of you that know plants know that this is the invasive Phragmites uh, common reed, but it's still a wetland and there's a lot of birds in that wetland. They, uh, they uh, were standing here at sunset waiting to hear some birds of the evening, uh, American bittern hopefully and how, uh, marsh wren and so on. So the wetlands in the evening are quite amazing. But during the day, they can also be pretty amazing. This is a rookery at Pinkney National Wildlife Refuge just before you go across the bridge onto Hilton Head Island, South Carolina. And it contains a lot of different wading birds that use this rookery together. They find uh, protection in it as well as convenience. And it's just one of the most amazing places I have ever visited in the U.S. Most of the time, these rookeries are closed to the public, but this one has a walking path around it, and it's located in such a way that the birds are in the middle and we're on the edges, and they become accustomed to photographing them and um, enjoying them quite a bit. So uh, this is the kind of craziness that I enjoy. This is what I call vacation, slapping the mosquitoes and bugs in the summertime. Um, but anyway, so what are the wetlands and why do they matter? Um, wetlands are areas that are predominantly covered by water through most of the year, if not all of the year. Uh, they support a, a, quite a variety of, of life, both uh, terrestrial animals as well as, and aquatic, as well as uh, plant life. You can't have the animals without the plants. So plants are the base of everything out here. As one uh, master gardener teacher said, 12 inches of topsoil is about all that supports life on this earth. Uh, that supports the plants that everything is based on. Wetlands are also big filters. They, uh, they take rainwater and they mitigate it a little bit and they help to recharge um, our aquifers. Those of us who are on wells, like I am out here in Geauga County, uh, we, we uh, are thankful for the clean water that's 70 feet down below the ground. And that's recharged through, uh, through some wetlands. During spring and fall migration, they provide uh, stopover habitat for migrating birds going either north or south. As you can see the, uh, the Canada geese here in a springtime picture of a wetland. And when you put this all together, they really are one of the most productive ecosystems that we have on earth. Um, <clears throat> so many studies go on with plants and animals and um, climate change and everything regarding wetlands. And so when you group this all together, this productivity and everything, they can also be very peaceful places to show up in a busy world. If you get a chance to visit one, and those of you that are on the west side of Cleveland, you have Sandy Ridge Reservation in the Lorraine Parks. They're beautiful. I understand there's some people as far south as Columbus. Uh, you are surrounded by some great parks down in the Columbus area as well. So what kind of birds though? We're talking about birds. What kind of birds are you gonna find there? Well, there's a variety of them. Let's start with the iconic ones, the wading birds. And this is where we're gonna spend a good deal of time is the bitterns and egrets, herons, ibises, storks, and spoonbills. Um, if you don't know what some of those are, that's good. I'm gonna introduce you to some new birds. We also talk about the waterfowl that primarily migrate through and use them. There are some marsh birds called uh, uh, cranes and limpkins and rails and so on. They're different than the wading birds, although some of them are somewhat wading. Some are fishermen. They're really, really cool. And then the ones that are also not primarily uh, wetland, but they come in, the raptors will come in, as well as the songbirds that we call them, the perching birds. 
all and there's a huge variety of them. They either live on or uh, adjacent to the wetlands. But let's start with the wading birds. And um, these are the iconic birds that people associate with, uh, with a wetland. We're gonna start with the um, egrets. Well, let me, I may be, I should introduce these pictures. In the top left corner, we bring you the snowy egret with its, you can't see it, but yellow slippers. In the top middle is a roseate spoonbill. Top right is the little blue heron. Uh, middle right edge is a wood stork. Bottom is a green heron. Uh, bottom middle is a cattle egret. Bottom left is the um, glossy ibis. And uh, middle left is the American bittern. And we're going to talk about all those in a little more detail. But we're going to group the egrets and herons here together to start with because they have a fair amount in common, <clears throat> not the least of which was um, they're hunting to near extinction in the late 19th and early 20th century, primarily for their plumage for ladies' hats. Um, and ironically, it was ladies who helped uh, get us out of that problem. And then the um, introduction of the Migratory Bird Act, which um, stopped the, the extinction, probable extinction of a lot of these birds. Um, most of them are white at some stage of their life, okay? And that, uh, that makes them uh, a little confusing if you're a new birder but I'm gonna give you some tips on that as we go along too. They all hunt similarly in shallow water. Um, they are really stalkers. You can learn a lot from them about being patient and walking slowly. And when they're, what they're doing is they're looking for something to eat and they eat almost anything, um, primarily living things, fish, frogs, snakes, um, crustaceans being things like crabs and crayfish and so on. Any big insect that comes by, and anything that's soft-bodied and creepy, um, they like them. Many of them breed together in rookeries, as we saw there in that short video up front. And at night, a lot of them get safety uh, by uh, roosting together in huge numbers, especially when you go down uh, along the Atlantic coast and into Florida and the Gulf Coast, where you've got some massive wetlands down there. Uh, we'll see a little bit of that. This next short little video will introduce you to a couple um, of the egrets. And this is from um, Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge outside of Fort Myers. The great egret is the yellow-billed one. And it's surrounded by a bunch of snowy egrets. Yeah, they're bills. feeding. If you watch them in the water. And the tide is in, and the fish came in with the tide back in this mangrove area, and all these guys are going looking for the fish that are in that area. They're just beautiful birds. Um, elegant uh, is, uh, I think, an apt adjective. So we'll start with the great egret. Uh, this guy is standing um, three and a half feet tall with a probably a four to five foot wingspan. And it catches all different kinds of fish. This, I think, is a chain pickerel. This is from the McGee Marsh area up along um, near between Toledo and Sandusky. Um, all, these, uh, all these birds take their fish and they flip them around and eat them head first because it folds their fins back. And so they slide easily all the way down those long necks to get to where they go. Um, even with the snakes and all this other stuff and frogs, they'll do them head first. The, um, they're not always beautiful. They start out as little babies that are, I guess, only a mother um, egret would love. And the babies have this habit of uh, really chewing on the parent's bill in order for the parent to regurgitate the food. The parents have gone off uh, collecting food, stored in their crop, and they will come back and respond. I don't know if you can see that big dark mass coming into that one baby egret's mouth but they'll regurgitate the food into the mouth of the babies um, as a result of this action. They're stunning birds up close. Um, I have a big thing for eyes. Uh, as a photographer, those of you that are in photography, I'm, I'm a so-so photographer, but I do know enough to know that they focus on the eye of animals when you go to do wildlife. So um, this is a breeding plumage, great egret, um, just a classic view here. They are primarily along the coast, but we get some of them up in our area here in Northeast Ohio. This is a springtime view of a, a pond along Music Street in Geauga County. And often the far left, you see two 
um, great egrets, and we call them Gregs, G-R-E-G, and that's an abbreviation for uh, great egret. Um, but they'll come and visit us in the springtime. Uh, and so those of us that keep track of our annual viewing, we like to get them on our list. Uh, here's an area, for, this is from uh, Sandy Ridge Reservation, those of you that know where that is. They feed in great numbers, these birds, a lot of times. And this was just an interesting uh, juxtaposition of these three birds as they were moving around looking for fish to eat. They, uh, in that movie, you also saw the snowy egret, and this is a, another bird that likes to congregate. Can you see the yellow feet all over the place? Um, when they get to be adults, that yellow is pretty pronounced. Some might call it golden green. Uh, it has more of a greenish tint in the immature birds, but you can um, easily identify these birds from uh, the great egret by looking at their bill, which is all black compared to yellow and looking at those feet, those yellow feet, nobody has yellow feet like that, no other egret or heron has them. But they, um, they move around, uh, we call them golden slippers. They move around on vegetation as well as uh, standing in the water eating. And this is the plumage that the market hunters were after in the late 19th and early 20th century. Those plumes and breeding uh, plumage are just uh, stunning. And they found ways to put them onto hats and other clothing items. You can see a begging baby in the background, uh, squawking here, the parent had just come back. And so it goes through that same begging action with uh, clamping onto the bill and the parent will share with, uh, share its uh, catch with the babies. Now the babies start this real early before they can even get up to the bill and look at these little guys, they're nothing but fuzzballs and they're chewing on the parent's leg. So they, they learn about that sort of an innate activity. This is how we typically see them foraging uh, in the shallow waters, very slowly moving around. And when they take off, um, it's just, I know, just stunning, those big wings and how they can pick them up and so on. The interesting little factoid is the oldest known snowy egret was about 17 years old. And they get this from banding data. Uh, they band, put little metal bands around the legs of these birds. Um, and if they're lucky enough to catch the bird again sometime in the future, they can compare their notes. And this is the oldest known bird. Um, another egret that's uh, small and white uh, most of the year, but gets a little bit of brown in it during breeding time, is the cattle egret. Now, these are introductions from Africa, uh, somewhere around the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s. And they were, I'm not sure how they got here, but they they followed grazing animals of all kinds around the continent of Africa. And they do the same kind of a thing here. Um, you're gonna find them more inland. Uh, they do go into wetlands, but um, uh, this one is in breeding plumage, uh, stunning colors, uh, the yellows, the oranges, uh, that lavender color in front of the eye and so on. And that just lovely brown coming down it. We just don't see these kind of colors very often in nature, but um, they're looking uh, for insects, mammals, uh, reptiles, and things like that. They follow the cattle, uh, especially down in the Florida and the Texas area where they have a lot of cattle, but they'll also follow, follow equipment that's stirring up action. This is down in Florida, and the guy is just brush hogging through there. And these are all cattle equipment. The a little noisy for your, uh, for the peace of nature, but um, it, it's just interesting to watch their activities. That's another thing with birders. Um, there are people who are listers, they get a bad name. They just list the birds they see and they move on. We enjoy listing to see how many different species we see, but we also wanna watch what's going on and the behaviors of birds, what they're doing and how the environment changes them. Um, so these guys are probably looking for insects here, but they also eat um, amphibians like toads. And we've got this guy here down in Florida and he's flipping that around. I told you that's pretty gross. So we won't spend a lot of time here, but um, they were on this uh, dike between areas and they were looking for anything to eat. Um, they have to be kind of opportunistic. Most of their life is spent looking for food and not getting eaten themselves. So that's what they do. Um, if you'll find them in groups. You may even see them in ditches. Uh, the first time I saw a cattle egret, I was going down to Disney World with my wife and you saw them along the highways in the ditches um, looking, foraging for food over there. 
Another egret, which is a little different looking, is the reddish egret. Um, we don't see as many of these. Uh, this is sort of a hyperactive cousin of all these ones you've seen so far. They typically like to go racing around in the wetland, stirring things up in the water, their wings flapping and everything. And the whole purpose of that is to stir up the fish so that they can catch them. Um, not a whole lot is known about these guys. Um, they're young. Uh, I'm not sure, but I don't have any rookery pictures of them or anything like that. But when they have a young bird, it's more dusky colored. Uh, it will get that, that pretty plumage uh, when it molts into adulthood, probably after a year or so, I'll give you back there. Uh, but right now it's this color. And there's actually a rare white morph of the, um, of the, the reddish egret. Um, you can tell it from the other ones based on the bill because it's, uh, its bill is uh, bicolored and it has sort of a fleshy color at the base with a black tip on it. No other um, egret has that combination of birds. So I'm looking at my notes here. This guy is stands only about two and a half feet tall. So these are small birds and they don't weigh a heck of a lot. This bird only weighs a pound, 16 ounces, uh, even though it's two and a half feet tall. So uh, that's it for the egrets that we see typically in the east. Uh, now we're looking at the herons and I'm, I would be surprised if, uh, if there was anybody in the crowd who hasn't seen a great blue heron somewhere. Um, they're all over our area uh, and they, they are here. Some of them actually spend the winter if they can find open water. They're just gorgeous birds. Um, you can tell them when they're flying by the S shape in the neck and you can see that in this standing bird. Uh, they too were hunted, not quite as much, uh, but look at that beautiful plume on this breeding, uh, breeding bird here. They like to uh, uh, breed in rookeries that is pretty much just great blue herons. And if you've been fortunate enough to see one of these, it's kind of a noisy place and you don't want to walk underneath it. Uh, you can get pooped on pretty easily. But they, um, their nest can have uh, a couple of babies in it. You sometimes wonder how the eggs can even uh, survive up in there. Um, these are less accessible to us than the Ibis Pond video I showed you in the beginning of the rookery. But um, if you can find one this time of year, they're pretty noisy places. These birds hunt, they will sometimes get in water as deep as their belly. And I've even seen some of them swim, although they don't do that very often. This guy stood in this one place and I watched him catch three different fish before he flew out. The first one was a bass. Um, I'd never seen uh, any of these birds catch a bass before and flipped, it was getting ready to flip it around. It's amazing the dexterity they have to be able to reposition these, uh, these fish and then be able to swallow it down. But he also caught a bluegill, a um, couple bluegills after this and then he flew out and I sort of marked that if I was more active with my fishing, I would have gone back there with a fishing pole. So there's a lot of fish in that spot. They also will eat catfish and the way they catch them is they spear them. Uh, this is from Sandy Ridge Reservation out on the west side. Um, this bird uh, kept smacking this catfish on the ground being sure that it was dead because if you're familiar with catfish, you know they have spines, two lateral spines and one dorsal spine. Um, and you want those spines to, to definitely not be moving when they're going down its throat. Otherwise, they could, the fish could make itself stick in the throat and that would be the end of the heron. So uh, obviously not the first catfish it had caught. But maybe the most bizarre thing I've ever seen uh, one of these birds, cat egret or heron eat, is a big goldfish. I got this picture last year. It's a terrible picture offhand in bad conditions. That's a big gold carp kind of a fish. Um, out of the Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge. And that fish probably weighs at least a pound. And that uh, heron only weighs about five pounds. So that's about 20% of its body weight that it's going to consume uh, in that fish if it gets it down. Um, I lost track of it. I don't know if it finished it, but um, um, that's, that was just interesting to me. And the last fact about these is, I didn't know if you know that these uh, great blue herons can walk on water. And these next couple of slides will show you that definitely they can walk on water. Actually, um, I have a number of birds that I've seen do this, grebes and um, uh, common loons, they do the same thing. There's a lot of action on the pushing off the water with their feet as they're trying to get enough momentum before they can take flight. So kind of cool. 
Um, a little note I have here on the side that the oldest known great blue heron was 24 years old. So when we're talking about wetland species and preserving the environment and all that, um, these birds are around for a long time and, and they don't last if we don't have the, uh, the habitats for them. So we want to preserve these wetland areas as much as possible. And by preserve, I'm not talking about putting in formaldehyde, maybe conserve is the proper word. The next heron is a little green heron. They used to call them little green herons. They call them green-backed herons, um, but now they're green heron. And this is a much smaller bird than the great blue. It's uh, a couple feet tall only, and usually pretty secretive. Um, they can be overlooked because they, they like to hang out back in the vegetation. They blend in pretty well. This was a picture from Ding, Dar um, Ding Darling last year, and um, up there with a blue wing teal. Uh, it's just sort of tucked in there. There was the end of the day and most of these birds will roost away. They are, they're stunning in their colors. I've always been attracted to them for their appearance. This one is at the Beaver Marsh, Ira Beaver Marsh in the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. That's a great place, by the way, if you have never been there, you really get out your map. Um, Ira Road is the parking area and you just follow the uh, trail a little bit north to the beaver marsh. It's a big walkway and you can see all kinds of ducks and waterfowl and passerines, everything is up there. But this is a, a breeding bird and he was getting a little hyper and started fluffing his feathers up. We were taking his picture. I mean, we were on the boardwalk. We weren't trying to get into his space any more than that. And finally, it was like his hair was on fire. It just really got rubbed up and then decided it was time to take off. So off he went. Orange feet is pretty, pretty dramatic too, and you see this guy. These are incredibly strong birds. Um, I've got a couple of pictures here to show you just how strong they are. This one from Florida last year, and the picture's not that great a quality, but the, uh, it was hanging onto this pipe, and the bird is about 18 inches long uh, when it's all stretched out. And it had stretched all the way out to the water line of this pipe to catch a little fish that was that tiny. And then it got itself, pulled itself back up on those feet. Just incredible. I have one other picture I found at a marina one time where one of these guys was hanging on to the mooring lines of a boat and it did the same thing and it pulls itself right back up. That's just incredible power. They eat fish, but they've also, uh, they also like tadpoles. And here's a nice uh, fat tadpole. This is from the Rookery in Geauga County Park. Um, it was catching several of these guys. It really, it had a bullfrog tadpole feast, if you will. And another one where there's a small fish uh, from Ibis Pond area at Pinckney. This one this is one of the first pictures I took when I got into photography. And this was on uh, at another marina and it was walking along the edges. Why I like these birds, I think the, the dramatic colors, but look at the detail, every single feather on the wing has an outline to it, um, which is just like, I don't know, unnatural type of thing. And every one of them has the same pattern. That's the reproducibility within nature. And here's what it looks like when they're, they're flying away. You can see that intricate pattern on everything. Um, beauty, wonder, and awe. That I'm stuck on all of those things. The little blue heron is <clears throat> a little bit taller than the green. Um, this one's kind of cool because uh, when it's young, it's white. And I mentioned this before, the, the, uh, that some of these guys are white at some stages of their life. So for the whole first year, this bird is primarily white and we know it's a little blue because of the beak. The beak has a light blue tint to it on the base with a black, uh, black uh, bill tip, if you will. And they do transition, they're kind of modeled as they're going through the molt into adulthood. So they can look a little messy during that time too. But um, little blue heron here. The babies are, they have their babies in that rookery. Um, they're kind of, I don't know, they're not terribly attractive. I'm trying to find the right words. Uh, they get better looking as they get older. So this one's begging from mom or dad. Both of the parents uh, get into feeding the birds here. Um, and as they get a little bit older, they're, uh, they're a little more attractive before they get some of that fuzz out of there. And these guys were anticipating the adults coming back. It was amazing at Ibis Pond, that, at Pinckney there, that many of the different species of birds, the uh, ibises, the herons, the egrets, 
they almost all flew out in a short period of time to go fish and hunt for food. And then they'd all start coming back several you know, uh, times later. Um, but they would come back in big groups. And these birds anticipated, they could hear them coming from a distance and they anticipated them coming. Um, this is just a nice picture of an adult that finally went away from the kids, flew up into another tree just to get a rest. Little blue heron. They eat a lot of uh, fiddler crabs that are millions of them all over in the tidal areas. This is a picture uh, down at, <clears throat> in Florida of, um, of one of them, uh, the juveniles. And once they get to be this size, they start migrating out and they migrate north and uh, northeast and northwest. And we even get them up in Geauga County from time to time. I showed you the great egret earlier. Um, this one is definitely a little blue heron, though, because of the, the beak color that we have on it. But this was in at uh, Ladue Reservoir in Geauga County, I think, back in 2016. The next one is uh, the tricolored heron. This is a really cool bird. Um, it's, a, it's very lightweight. Let me get to look on my list here. The tricolor is only 26 inches long and weighs 13 ounces. It looks like a huge bird for all these feathers, but feathers don't have a lot of weight. Hollow bones don't have a lot of weight. Um, I don't know how I got that out of sequence here, but uh, they have a, a bicolor bill as well and um, a little more yellow in it. Depends if you get them in the breeding plumage or not. And down the neck, I don't know if you can see, I don't have any face on views, but the, there's a white streak all the way down the neck um, on tricolored herons. This one has beautiful yellow skin where that orange eye meets it. Um, just stunning colors, I think. Their babies, back to that rookery again, um, look very different. They're brown and white. And um, these guys are all sticking together. That's, that's a lot of mouths to feed. You have three, three of them there. Um, as they're getting a little bit older, uh, fleshing out here a little bit, getting rid of some of that uh, fluff, baby fluff. And then they get even a little bigger yet, uh, better looking yet as they get older. Um, these guys are almost ready to be called handsome. This one looked unusual because the, I don't know if it's just the angle, but that bill just looks so long. I would think, I don't think I want to get into a fight with this guy. That's a, a lot of bill. That one is actually on a, um, on a standing on a boardwalk handrail. That's uh, at a particular, they get so used to people, unfortunately. So that's it for herons and egrets. Uh, we're going to move on now. How am I doing here on my time? Let me flip up here about getting near halfway through. Um, other wading birds. Um, might not call them wading birds, but we've got a couple of night herons, the black crown night heron that hunts primarily at night. And during the daytime, it will go into uh, the cattails and sort of uh, hang out in there and does most of its uh, hunting at, at dusk and at dawn through the night. They uh, use the same rookery as these other guys. You can see the brown birds there. This is what their young look like. Um, these are hardy birds. They are more stocky than the herons and the egrets. Um, they have a bigger appetite, but they also come further north. And this is one from along uh, the, up the Cuyahoga River in downtown Cleveland in the wintertime. You can see the snow there. So they will actually winter here. And they look kind of like a cargo plane to me when they're flying away. A stout body with substantial wings that get them through there. They're related to the yellow crown night heron, which uh, does not hunt so much at night. It will, but primarily it's a diurnal hunter. Um, the appearances are very different. Uh, still has that heavy bill. Uh, they eat a lot of crustaceans, both of these. Um, but during the daytime, these guys will be in the tidal marshes looking for crabs. Um, as this unlucky little crab found out. They uh, eat a lot of them and uh, find them in areas like this. If you've been down there, you know there's, when the tide starts going out, there's millions of these guys, literally millions all over the place. Um, the yellow crowns are actually more widely dispersed and we have them uh, in our area somewhat. This is a nest in a residential neighborhood at the edge of downtown Columbus, Ohio. These are sycamore trees that hang out over the, um, over the street. And it's just a beautiful setting with these grand old homes there, but this nest is right over the middle of the street. Now there was a wetland nearby, um, which is probably what they would go to for food, but this was the best place that they could find 
apparently for a nest. And they use this tree year after year. Uh, this was taken probably more than 10 years ago, this picture, but um, uh, it was a great find. They're young. <clears throat> the young of these two birds uh, have similarities in that they're brown and white speckled. But um, for those of you that care about identification, the one on the left is a yellow crown. And we know that because its bill is all dark and the uh, white striping on the bird is very fine. It's like someone used a fine pen. The one on the right is a black crown night heron, always has yellow in the bill and it has more pronounced white markings on its wings and um, uh, to, to help figure it out. They're still hard at a glance. They don't always give you this nice comparison to be able to figure them out. And oftentimes I, I posted the wrong one in my eBird checklist and been chastised for it. That's how I learned these things. There's a bird that looks like them that's not a night heron and it's the American bittern. And if you compare it to these juvenile night herons, if you're a beginner, you really are confused now. Actually, not quite so because you see that long striping. It's quite a different looking bird. It's a larger bird, but not by a heck of a lot. Um, the American bittern, uh, we're at the south end of its breeding territory, actually, in northern Ohio here. They move slowly and purposefully through there. I don't know if you can see that big feet with wide toes that help them to move through the vegetation without sinking down. Um, and perhaps one of the things they're most known for is that when they get scared, they stop and put their head straight up. And if they happen to be in cattails, it's almost impossible to find them because of those long uh, parallel streaks going up there. But most of the time they're moving through the vegetation, uh, looking for something here, uh, fish or frogs, snakes again, uh, to eat. Now, here's a sound that hopefully you can hear this. This is a, one of the most unusual sounds in the marsh. And usually you hear it right just before dark. We happened to be fortunate to hear that in May this year when we made our annual pilgrimage up to uh, McGee Marsh area for three days of birding. And we stayed on a uh, site into dark and first time I had really ever heard them outside. I've heard this song so many, many times I knew it, but uh, it was amazing to hear. But as they're stalking around there, they're catching small fish, they're all kinds of different sort of prey that is in here. This one looks angry to me. Um, with the way the eyes come and the eyebrow and everything, uh, looks like not to be messed with. They're related somewhat to a much smaller bird called the least bittern. And this is the environment. I wanna show you what it's like, cattail marsh. This is back to Ibis Pond um, at Pinckney Wildlife Refuge in uh, South Carolina. And this little guy has got big feet and he moves around through the cattails primarily. We, you're, this was just so fortunate to be able to see them out in the open because usually they're back inside of it. And what they're looking for again is uh, some fish on the edge of the water or a big insect that comes by. I don't have a large amount of pictures um, uh, because these are pretty secretive birds. You usually see them as they're flying from one spot in the cattails, they'll fly up and they'll move and they'll go to another spot. And that's about it. So they're, um, it's only about uh, 13 inches long, this bird, and it weighs a quarter of a pound. Amazingly light uh, birds here that have just a lot of attitude. We move on to ibises. We've got a couple ibises, the white ibis. This is a very gregarious bird. Uh, we see them in large flocks all over. This is a roosting site uh, by Anna Maria Seafood House, uh, where Patty and I oftentimes uh, go for dinner when we're down in Florida. And we, we first come here and watch the birds coming to their evening roost. And there'll be a whole assemblage of birds. Um, we've got some cormorants in there, but most of the white birds are, um, are the uh, white ibises. Um, this is what they look like in back there in Ibis Pond on the rookery. They get kind of dirty because they're sitting on all those dirty sticks with the lichens on them and everything else. But this is a, a working bird here. Their babies are dark. This is so we're flip flopping here instead of having white babies, they have dark babies. And one interesting thing about them is that the bill starts out straight. You saw the downturn in the last one. The bird on the right, it's got a bicolored bill and it's pretty straight. The one on the left, it's got a little bit of color left in it, but you can see it's getting longer and it's starting to curve downward. 
And then sort of in their in-between stage, um, this is what they look like as they're transitioning to the all white bird. And it will eventually have a red bill with a black tip on it, like these breeding um, white ibises. Very cool, the uh, uh, birds, they, they're small, but um, mighty. Let me see, the white ibis, uh, this is about a two pound bird, even though it's only two feet tall. And you see them clustered many times in shallow waters like this. Most of those birds out there are white ibises. And here's some adults. Uh, they, there's some trees off to the edge of the nesting area at Ibis Pond and the adults get away. It's like, you know, a lounge area for them. They're related to the glossy Ibis that is found pretty much only along the Atlantic coast and probably more abundant in Europe and Africa than it is over here. But these are another uh, ones that like to cluster together in, in fairly large flocks. They have that downward turn bill. They're, um, my experience with them is that they're in very well vegetated areas as they're probing around uh, looking for things to eat. We see them in flocks flying oftentimes, and this is the way they will come into roost where you'll see there's probably 30 or more birds here and they all sort of come in and glide and, and get onto their roost spot. Switching gears a little to um, uh, one of the last birds we're talking about with the iconic uh, ones is the, the wood stork. Um, there's a lot of storks in Europe, but this is our only U.S. stork. Uh, amazing black and white wings. This is a, a large bird that's about three feet tall and uh, weighs in at about five pounds. So that puts it in the same category as a great blue heron. Um, when it's flying, it's unmistakable. Um, this black and white wing pattern is just unmistakable. When they're fishing, they take that great big bill and they move it through the water while they hold a wing out to create a shadow on the water. And the, the minnows, the small fish, are attracted to the shade and they come closer to that big old bill and uh, they get swept up. This was actually unusual young birds that came up. This was in Coshocton, Ohio, many years ago, um, in a pond out in the middle of nowhere. And the, word, the bird network started talking about them. We just rarely see wood storks in Ohio. But down on Hilton Head Island, they're there all the time and they're just sitting around preening. They look a lot like a vulture with the way they have that uh, naked head and all this stuff. Um, prehistoric to be sure, uh, definitely an old, old style bird. Um, contrast that ugliness, if you will, of that head with the beauty of the roseate spoonbills. These are amazing, beautiful birds in my opinion, my opinion only, but they hang, you can see they hang with the wood storks there in that picture, storks on the left. Uh, this is actually the very first picture I ever took of um, of the spoonbills. When you get up a little closer to them, you can see that big spatula spoon type bill that they're named for. The bird on the right is a, um, a young bird. It's mostly pink. It's getting uh, developing colors that it gets from the food that it eats. Uh, a lot of the shrimp that have uh, pink in their color. And the one on the left is an adult that uh, you can see that striking red through the, through the wing. And if you remember, if we were doing a test here, I'd say, okay, what's the bird in the middle? And if you said tricolored heron, you would be right. I'm sorry, reddish egret. <laughs> I'm getting a little cocky with myself here. That's a reddish egret in the middle back there. The, um, uh, this was down at Ding Darling where I saw all of these guys, quite a few of them. Let's have a big yawn, please. And they do, uh, they do preen with those big bills. Uh, we can watch a short little video here of them. But they primarily move that bill through the water as they're um, siphoning up uh, all sorts of small animals to eat. You can see the mix of young birds and adult birds mixed in here. Pretty amazing. People talk about, hey, have you seen the spoon bills when you're down in Florida? Well, I saw one down here. They're always willing to share sightings with you. So that's it for the iconic species. And we're 40 minutes into this thing. And now I'm gonna start ramping up and, and going a little faster because I do have a waterfowl talk. It's uh, migrating waterfowl and winter birds of Northeast Ohio. Most of my talks are related to Northeast Ohio. Um, I wanted to do for a long time this, um, this uh, uh, wading bird talk though, because I had so many pictures and no place to put them. We don't have many native ones up here in Northeast Ohio. But we do have plenty of ducks, geese, and swans. 
Everybody's familiar with the mallard. Uh, this is the duck from which our domestic duck probably evolved, according to Cornell. Um, they do have lots of babies and um, they, they're around uh, pretty much any of the big ponds. They even can be putting their nest underneath your mailbox as they did in my son's house one time. Um, didn't last very long, there's too many predators in that area, but uh, they have lots of babies. Uh, as do the wood ducks. The wood duck is um, one of two tree ducks that we have uh, in wetlands. They like to nest in old woodpecker holes and things like that. So we can support them, their populations by putting artificial nest cavities in as many parks and wildlife areas and refuges do. They too have lots of babies. I've counted as many as 14 babies coming behind one female wood duck. I'm not sure if they were all hers, but uh, they were following behind. It's my favorite duck, um, primarily because of the uh, intricacies of the colors and all that. This is at Sheldon's Marsh um, and just the beauty. This is an unusual picture in that the, the gold water is the result of the morning sun shining on a maple tree and the yellow leaves casting a gold hue onto the surface of the water. And we're on a boardwalk and there's no less than a dozen photographers laying on their belly trying to get these pictures of the wood ducks on a gold palette. Uh, nothing better. The other uh, tree duck that we have is a black belly whistling duck. Kind of a funny looking duck with its fleshy colored feet. Um, they almost look like they don't belong. But yes, you can see them up in trees too. And um, uh, they're more down in the south, down in the Carolinas and down to Florida area. They flush out, they've got some characteristic sounds, whistling noises that they make. But more than that, they have an unusual flight. It's, I don't know how they do this, but the way that go up and down like that um, makes them kind of crazy. Uh, the last cavity nesting duck that we have in our area, just during migration primarily, is the hooded merganser. And uh, here's the female uh, of the two. They are uh, primarily, there's some that breed up here in Northeast Ohio, but primarily they go further north um, into Canada to breed. And this is uh, another crazy call. So I'm gonna activate this one and listen for this. It's a pop, wah, wah. That's nuts. <laughs> So these are some, some of the ducks. We can also see other ones. Uh, we have American black ducks that come through, the um, redheads, the gadwalls, the northern pintail, that's a real elegant looking bird. Canvasback, which is often confused with the redhead, but you get a little bit of practice and uh, you can separate those two. <clears throat> ring neck ducks, there is a ring around its neck. That's in my talk, I can show you actually a ring around its neck and lesser and greater scop, the northern shoveler, the ruddy duck, a neat little duck. It actually has a blue bill during, uh, during some times of the year. Uh, blue wing teal, green wing teal, and the gadwall. These are all <clears throat> ducks that we see primarily during migration um, in our wetlands. Uh, the rare and elusive Canada goose, that uh, if you're a golfer, you, I'm sure you embrace this bird. Uh, love the cigars that it leaves all over the, the fairways and so on. Uh, they will nest on, on muskrat mounds around here. You can see the little baby under the wing at a marina over along Lake Erie. And now we have a universal, ah, uh, for the baby. Um, they have a lot of uh, unkind names for them, depending on your relationship with them. But um, at one time, they were really hard to find. When I was a kid, and I'm 72 years old now, when I was a kid, it was a rarity to be able to see Canada goose. Uh, you had to go to the Pimatuming Goose Preserve uh, to find them out there. We also have trumpeter swans that come through the area. I go back to that map. They used to be primarily nesting up in uh, Alaska and along the Pacific coast there up in the uh, Can Canadian areas, but now they've been moved back into Northeast Ohio. They were here once upon a time and they've been reintroduced. Uh, a stunning bird weighing in at about 25 pounds and you can see the mark around its neck. This is one of the uh, earlier birds being reintroduced to Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, their babies are called cygnets and they are gray in color. Uh, so you can spot them easily when you're seeing them during migration. It's 
Sounds like a trumpet. <laughs> it's quite a sound when you're in a quiet marsh in the evening. Some other marsh birds that we see, um, uh, sandhill cranes, we have those in Ohio too. They're, they've been moved from endangered uh, status to threatened, primarily because of habitat, not that anybody's shooting them. Uh, but there, there's millions of them in the Midwest, but we, it's a marginal area for us in Ohio. Um, they have babies that they call, we call colts. Um, they almost look like ostriches sometimes when they're all wet like this in the morning and, and so on. And they've got another crazy call too. It's the rattle. Kind of cool. We started doing breeding bird surveys on them in April in Northeast Ohio. We'll be doing our third one this coming April. Common gallinus, more common down in Central Ohio than up here. Uh, we do get one or two of them though all over the place uh, in, the, in the marshes of the South and along the Gulf Coast. Their babies are um, kind of rag, long-legged, scraggly little guys. And these are all vegetation eaters. They don't, uh, they don't eat the animals so much, although the babies they might, uh, might feed a high protein insects too, but they're vegetation eaters. You can hear this call. Go to any of the wetlands down southeast and, and you'll hear that all the time. Get along here. Purple gallinu, um, a really unusual bird. I'll show you this big picture here to show you the kind of habitat. They're, they walk along the lily pads. Um, this gives you an up close one that caught a nice dragonfly that it's going to eat. And the way they can walk across that is look at the size of those toes. That is crazy. This bird was actually in Lorain County more than 10 years ago. Uh, we rarely see um, purple gallinu in Ohio, uh, at least up in Northeast Ohio. Um, but they're, they're marching around and in the center of this picture um, between the purple gallinu and the white flower to its right is a baby. You can just see one baby. They've two babies actually uh, by the other lily pad. So they started at an early age following their parents around. Another little marsh bird is the Sora. We do have these that breed in uh, our area. Throwing Meadows up here in Geauga County has them. You could hold this bird in the palm of your hand. It's got like a chicken-like bill on it. And as it moves uh, through all the cattails and the thickets and everything, it's looking for any kind of critter that moves. Insects primarily, uh, larva of different kinds. Virginia rails are in there with them. Um, they're kind of cool birds and they make some strange sounds too. We don't have a recording here, but you heard the expression thin as a rail. That's because these birds are built kind of like sunfish where they're wider than they are wide, than, than they are thick, if you will. So they can easily slip between uh, the vegetation as they're probing around looking for food. There are two rails to consider. Um, and this, the king rail, which uh, is exclusively a freshwater species. This picture was from Honda Wetlands. That, those of you that are down in Columbus, uh, taken several years ago, as it was flapping around, giving us a good display. And then it, it morphed a little bit as it went back into the reeds. Uh, the clapper rail um, is a saltwater species, exclusively in the saltwater marshes. And you can see a better picture of one here. They, um, they also have their characteristic noises that they make here. But um, uh, quite cool birds, uh, secretive, all of them. Unlike the limpkin that um, you can see it here, it's camouflaged in the background in the dark as we get up a little closer. This, um, this is one of the loudest voices in the marsh. These guys exclusively are eating apple snails, which is a tropical freshwater snail. And um, see if I can get a picture of one here. Th here's what they look like. This is... Um, this is a snail and this is a picture I stole off the internet because I don't have an apple snail picture, as well as the next one here, where, which are apple snail eggs that you see on the vegetation. So um, uh, these, are, these are the things that keep the limpkin in our area. And I've got a little recording of its sound. The screamer. If you're in a hotel room next to a golf course, you can oftentimes hear those. 
Um, ever hear of water turkeys, the Anhinga? Well, that's what, um, that's what we have uh, going throughout these wetlands as well. This was called the devil bird. Um, it, uh, maybe because of its color, maybe because of its sneaky habits. Um, the males are, um, are all dark like this, beautiful coloration. They're always drying their wings because they fish underwater. Um, pretty incredible. The um, uh, females and the young of the year have this brown neck and chest area. But when they're swimming, looking for fish, they're pretty much almost always submerged with just their necks showing out. Maybe that's where the devil bird thing came from. They will nest on their own out in a tree like this in the wetland, um, or they will be in that, uh, that busy, busy rookery over at Ibis Pond. These are a couple of young ones. Actually, that's some beautiful colors um, on here with nice contrast with the tan black and white. They spear their fish. Um, they eat all kinds of fish. And so you can, uh, you can see them if you're watching them for a while. This is an up close view, one of my favorite pictures. Anytime I get up close on eyes, um, just look at the detail of that. You can see a pupil surrounded by a ring. The iris has a ring around and then blue surrounding that, um, just stunning the colors of nature. And one of my accidental artistic pictures is next, is this one here. Uh, this reminds me of, uh, of a Chinese painting. And I've given it to a few people and I've got to quit threatening to get it uh, mounted, but I, I think I've, one of these days I'm going to actually send it out and get it mounted. Uh, very pretty scene at a pond, just the right time of day, the fog and all that. Uh, switching from that to a pied billed grebes, we have those up here in Northeast Ohio during the winter time and our, I'm sorry, in the uh, summertime in our marshes. This is a winter bird. Pied means two colors. And so here's your breeding uh, bird with a two colored bill. And another picture which I stole off the internet because I don't have a good baby picture of baby groups, but this has to be one of the cutest little baby animals that I have ever seen. Uh, this zebra striping on it and colors and everything. Uh, my picture by contrast is not internet. This is my picture of it. So that's why I felt I had to go and, and steal you a good picture for you, the public. Um, they eat fish, they eat frogs. Uh, they'll eat tadpoles, they'll eat just about anything. And they're uh, a common feature, uh, especially during, um, we see a lot of them during migration because they go from here further north too. So in the fall migration, we see a lot of them along our lakes. Shorebirds are seen in our wetlands. Uh, this is a dunlin. They actually stir up the, the wetlands over at Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge to get all the uh, organisms up into the mud. And the dunlin by the hundreds follow these machines um, to, to go behind them and look for uh, insects and larvae and fish and crustaceans and everything. These are um, <coughs> uh, snipe, Wilson snipe. You can see the snow. They're one of our earliest migrants to come in, the long bill. And here's a better picture of them uh, in the wetlands. So we see them as well as a variety of sandpipers, different kinds, we won't get into details here. This is a talk unto itself, yellow legs and so on. Now we transition to, we're closing down here pretty much, uh, hit some raptors for you, hawks, owls, and eagles that are typical in, um, in wetlands. And the red-shouldered hawk for sure. Uh, this is a pretty agile hawk. Uh, they're all over the place. Uh, you'll see one from Florida here in a minute. This is an adult with a beautiful rusty breast. The uh, juveniles have brown streaks, teardrops almost, uh, down their breasts for the first year until they uh, get older. If you look at the wing on that juvenile to the left, you see a little tan through those primary feathers. That's on both wings and that's a characteristic marking for those of you who are trying to get better with your hawks. When you see it flying and you can see those uh, wing marks out there, those clear panels through the wings, that's a, a red-shouldered hawk. They're agile, they move through the bush. This one's almost running through. They're half the weight of a red-tailed hawk, but all the same basic size. And if you see them overhead, an adult male is just stunning or adult male and female, adult bird, they're pretty stunning. Down in Florida, they're lighter colored. They're smaller birds uh, down there. This one was right after a rainstorm that we were walking through a, a, an area and it just sat there and let everybody go underneath it. But it actually flew right towards me while I was taking pictures and I thought it was coming at me, but it, it picked up a little lizard that was about two feet away from me. That was kind of a Autobahn moment, we call them. Northern Harriers used to be called the marsh hawks. Uh, 
gray ghost is what they refer to the males as, as their um, gray color. And they course is the term. They course over the wetlands uh, looking for um, little mammals primarily to eat. The females and the young of the year are brown in color. Um, but you can see this one here just uh, maybe 20 feet off the ground. This is the kind of habitat that they're after up in our area. This is up in uh, the marshlands up along Lake Erie. And then they'll actually hover in one spot and drop down right on top of a mouse, a metal vole, something like that. We get short-eared owls primarily in the wintertime in our wetlands. They are uh, big mousers. Uh, they catch all kinds of little rodents. Uh, they're like little um, torpedoes on wings, in my opinion, the way they come through. You can see the beautiful facial discs on them. Uh, we love watching them. They're crepuscular. They like to hunt at dusk and at dawn, primarily. The other owl is a screech owl. They like to nest and they're here year round in our area, but they're, they're a major feature in wetlands. They're only about eight inches tall and they come in uh, gray colors and the red morph, they call it. They, will, they do nest in hollow cavities and will take well to uh, structures if you put them out there. Bald eagle is on all of our wetlands. Uh, it takes four years to go from this first year brown bird on the right to the full adult on the left. They get a lot of fish for sure, but they will also take roadkill. Um, so uh, this is a quick couple of pictures. You can't always turn your camera into um, video mode, but here's one catching and boom, there's a fish. And that's kind of how they do it. And then we wind up with our birds of the passerines, the perching birds in the wetlands. The kingfisher is um, almost always found in their oversized beak for this bird. It's only about 10 inches or 12 inches long, but um, makes its, its nest in the bank of a stream. You'll often find them in gravel pits and all that. So the uh, beautiful banding on them, nice coloration. And I don't know how this guy is going to get that whole fish down its throat. We talked about red-winged blackbirds earlier. Um, they love cattails where they, they put their nest. The female looks like a big sparrow. First time I saw a beautiful one, I thought I had a new species of sparrow. Uh, we got a picture of this nest and the parents were bombarding us as we took it and we took a quick snap and boom, got out of there. Uh, this is a, a great blue heron that got too close to the cattails where I'm sure there is a nest. And this blackbird was just nesting on there and top of this bird and the heron could care less. Little warblers will find, yellow warblers are, they like the, the brushiness near the wetland. They gather all kinds of stuff here, feathers and soft materials from plants and all that as they fashion a nest that mom will uh, settle down into and have her babies. Prothonotary warblers are in our swamps, which is a wetland dominated by trees. And they are cavity nesters as well. Uh, they used to be called the golden swamp warbler because that perfectly defines what they do. Any cavity will do. It doesn't have to be an old woodpecker hole. This is a, a stump, uh, again, just up uh, north of Ira Beaver Marsh um, in the Cuyahoga Valley. And that stump had a little opening in it that uh, the babies stuck their heads out of to get the uh, critters that mom was bringing back to them. She got all different kinds of uh, flies, moths, and uh, things like that. I took pictures for over an hour, but they do take well to artificial nest cavities as well. Common yellow throat, uh, witchetty witchetty birds. Uh, the males have this characteristic mask. The females and the young of the year, this is a transitioning male, have a bright yellow throat, but are otherwise pretty drab and hard to find because they like this kind of habitat to be in. We've got all kinds of swallows in the wetland, but the tree swallow likes to nest there. It's a cavity nester as well, and will compete with the prothonotary for its um, uh, nest cavities when they put them up. So there's a, a big prothonotary project um, down in Columbus area, uh, as well as up on uh, the upper Cuyahoga River here in Geauga County. All the swallows tend to flock in the fall in the wetlands adjacent to lakes and all of that. And then they will migrate out as a huge group um, somewhere around November, along with purple martins and different kinds of swallows. Northern flicker is used to be called the yellow shafted flicker till they grouped them together, the red shafted of the West. Um, they eat a lot of ants, but they are cavity nesters as well. 
and they prefer a wetland where there's a lot of bugs. There's some stunning pictures there. And the swamp sparrow, characteristic of our wetland areas. They're all over Northeast Ohio, even staying into the winter. And then we're finishing up here. This is the last things as we're into one hour and one minute. Uh, other things you might find in the wetlands. I mentioned that photographers take pictures of lots of other stuff. So we take pictures of dragonflies and damselflies and butterflies and bees and bees and wasps and bullfrogs and alligators. This was from Ibis Pond, by the way. The alligators around there as you're walking, you gotta watch. And snakes and Blanding's turtle at uh, uh, McGee Marsh area. You can see them routinely. And snapping turtles and painted turtles and beavers. These are all animals that you're liable to see in the wetland and even baby uh, deer will be uh, through the edges of it there. A meadow vole, a mink. This was along the Cuyahoga or the Chagrin River in Geauga County. Muskrats, possums, raccoons, and even weasels. And I told you there's a bazillion fiddler crabs. There's a bazillion of them, along with arachnids of various kinds, orb weavers, garden spider, this is uh, from down in South Carolina, this guy, and different sort of pollinators that we have all over the place. So um, all these things, flies, more flies, and the end. So that's it, Ryan and Sue, whoever's on there, I'm going to stop my sharing right now and see if you have any questions that have arisen. First, first off, Matt, thank you so much. That that was amazing to, to see everything. I especially loved, uh, as you pointed out, when you can capture the eyes uh, of the birds. Those pictures were absolutely stunning to see everything up and close to see. I remember the one in particular where you were talking about the pupil with the overline with the blue outer lining of everything like that. Like, I, I just remember I, 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 have a, I have a camera in front of my screen here on it. But I just remember kind of like looking around the camera, like, oh my gosh, like, like that. It was just a stunning picture. It just really captured my eye on everything. So thank you. Thank you. Um, we have one question come, came in. And if anyone else has any questions, please uh, feel free to throw anything in the Q&A or chat or any comments as well. Uh, but one question was, uh, for some of the birds you mentioned, I, I remember in particular, it was the catfish one in particular where you have the split spine and you talked about that and you talked about the birds stabbing it with beak. So someone had asked, uh, they said, so obviously you talked about with, I think it was um, with the egrets, how they kind of flip the, the, the fish around on it. How did the birds who stab the, the, the fish then, then actually eat the fish? They'll throw it, they'll throw it down again and then pick it back up in their bill. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's the only way that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say, because I, I read the question, I was like, that, that's kind of, that is a tricky thing to do. Like if it's like locked onto your mouth in some way, how do you do that? Okay, so you do stick onto the ground and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, someone here asked uh, with, uh, they also appreciate all the pictures you had. What, what type of camera do you, do you prefer to use or what ca camera do you use when you're trying to take all these pictures? My personal camera is a um, is a digital um, digital single lens reflex. It happens to be Canon with a 100 to 400 millimeter lens. Um, so I can I can go to 100 millimeter if I'm too close and I want to get a little more background. And I can scoot up to 400 millimeters if the birds are at a distance. And I also put a um, an extender a 1.2 extender on it. So it, it takes me up to uh, effectively over 500 millimeters with it. It weighs five pounds and it lives around my shoulder, but there are a lot of new digital cameras that are much lighter weight, uh, lenses that are equally as good or better um, that, uh, you know, if you don't mind spending more money, uh, my setup is worth about $5,000, but um, you could spend that kind of money and more and, and get to weight down to half with some of the new digital technology that they've got and um, full frame cameras and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. it, it's a, it's a long, arduous decision to buy a good camera. Um, but that being said, if you've got a little point and shoot camera with a that goes digitally to, to 20x, and almost everybody's got one of those, 
Um, a lot of good pictures come off of those. If you have good light, you're close and you have a steady hand. That's really the most important things. Yeah, and I think as you kind of were saying, like the DSLR cameras and then it just kind of figuring out what lens you'd like on that. I know my dad and my brother are really into photography and they go back and forth talking about different things. And uh, it's, um, yeah, I mean, but meanwhile, I I like the phone camera because it's just easy. It's in your pocket all the time, but it's just based on what your uh, yep. needs are on that there. You can actually, uh, we actually use the phones to take pictures through our spotting scopes. Our spotting scopes are typically 20 to 60 power spotting scopes. And we position the camera uh, lens off of our digital cameras. Once we focus in on the subject, we position it over the eyepiece and take pictures that way. And it, it's more problematic if you've got these phones with two and three camera lenses on them. But if you have a single lens on your digital on your iPhone or your you know Android yeah. phone, they take really nice pictures. It, it takes a while getting used to it, but it, it can be done for sure. I didn't, I didn't think about that with the, with the zoom thing to it. Um, kind of lots of questions coming in here. So, um, uh, so someone commented on wetlands kind of, uh, decreasing in Ohio over, over time. And are you aware of any efforts to expand or, or protect the wetland areas? Those get down to local issues that I mentioned at the very beginning of this talk, that if you think this is beautiful and wonderful and all that, and you want to see more of it for you and your children and your grandchildren, um, you got to speak up when people are, are wanting to drain wetlands to, for agriculture, more agriculture or for uh, developments of different kinds. So there's always, there are always groups like the Audubon Society. We have many different chapters. I know you, you mentioned at the beginning here, you'd like me to say something about Audubon chapters, <clears throat> these are grassroots things where people get in and help support what's going on in the local level. And I think that's where we have the most influence. Um, there are Audubon chapters all over. If you're from the, I know I go back again to this Columbus area, Columbus Audubon is a big local chapter. We're on the east side of Cleveland, the uh, Audubon Society of Greater Cleveland. You've got um, Western Cuyahoga Audubon that's in the Rocky River area. They meet at Rocky River Nature Center, Black River Audubon out in Lorain County, Black Brook Audubon in Lake County. Any one of those chapters you can get in touch with and um, get involved and see what they're doing. But um, yeah, there's, there's all kinds of groups trying to preserve money. The, probably the Nature Conservancy and Western Reserve Land Conservancy and people like that are doing the most for us because they go in and they look at these areas that are up for sale and they find something unusual about them, which allows them to get grant money to be able to purchase them and then preserve that as land, not preserve, conserve that land. And oftentimes then they'll put it back into the hands of a group like Audubon or like a city or a, or, or a Geauga Park District or Cleveland Metro Parks. But mm -hmm. they're the ones who are doing the most probably on the ground right now. It takes a lot of money, a lot of savvy, um, knowing how to get grants and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then taking that and, and putting into organizations like the Audubon Society, where you know they're going to take good care of it, and yep. you know that they're going to really work for it. So um, two questions I see in the chat here. Uh, the first one, how great is the, and excuse me if I'm wrong on this, Phragmite to what? Phragmites. Phragmites, thank you. So, it's a huge so, problem. It's an invasive, it's an invasive species that um, uh, takes over areas. It can be controlled. Um, it requires you to um, take a deep breath when we use the word herbicide um, and know that there are safe herbicides to use. I'm also a master gardener volunteer. And one of the things we learn is the safe use of, of different chemicals for doing things like controlling Phragmites. Um, you drive down the road, once you see it, you'll see it everywhere. You'll notice it everywhere in ditches, on vacant land and so on. But it goes beyond Phragmites. We're, our, our Audubon chapter uh, owns over 500 acres of sanctuaries. And my personal passion is to get in and get the buckthorn out of there. Buckthorn is an invasive tree that can overwhelm your, uh, your uh, uh, uplands. And right now we're doing that. And two ways that we do it is to cut it and then take that stump that we just cut and put some herbicide on it with a very little dauber. It's a very surgical approach. We're not hitting anything else. 
The other one is to mow it down. And as it's coming back up as fresh new green leaves, they're very susceptible to a different kind of herbicide that we spray on those leaves. And then we, that goes back in and kills the root. It's the only way to get to these guys is to really, you got to go at them with the big guns. And I know it's distasteful to all of us in nature. We don't like to soil our environment with chemicals, but sometimes to control them, that's all that we can do. And Phragmites can be controlled by those who know what they're doing. Absolutely. And the last question that we have here is uh, with the sounds. It, it, some of the birds kind of, and other animals in nature do this too, but kind of mimic sounds of other animals. So the question was, is how can you know that this is a bird making that sound when it might sound like a frog or it might sound like another animal? My most embarrassing moment as a Boy Scout leader was taking a group of Boy Scouts down the trail at, at the camp. And I said, it was already dark. And I said, there's a bird in this bush and we've got to find it. And it turned out to be a gray tree frog. <laughs> <laughs> so chipmunks, gray tree frogs, red squirrels, they all have high pitched sounds that sound like birds. Okay. And all I can tell you is um, you just got to be patient with yourself, go with people who know what they're song and learn bird song. Um, we okay. walk in the woods now and I have a list of maybe the other day I, I did a walk and I had 44 species of birds and I probably only saw about 15 of those species. All the other ones were by their songs because there's so much vegetation and the birds are in it. So you got to, it just takes time and you got to want to do it. Time, practice, and the knowledge that even the experts who have been doing it for years will still make mistakes on it all. And not to time to time. Yep. On it all. Perfect. So, yeah. uh, so I'm not seeing any other questions. And just a quick, uh, I'm going to quickly share my screen here for uh, all of you. So just kind of just a brief, uh, let people know what's going on. Up next, uh, next Wednesday, July 13th at 11 a.m., we have Make a Plan with Kendo at Home. That's an informational virtual seminar for any uh, one who wants to uh, Learn more about Kendo at Home, what we have to offer, uh, how we can try to, how we try to stay proactive on the aging cycle and help people to age in place successfully. So that's for any potential members, loved ones, neighbors, friends, family, uh, anyone who you think would benefit from knowledge of Kendo at Home a little bit more. And then on Friday, July 22nd at 11 a.m., it's going to be our Healthy Aging Matters series. Uh, this one's going to be with Beyond Driving with Dignity. So that's going to be with Matt Gerwell, who's a retired Ohio State trooper and uh, founder of Beyond Driving with Dignity, talking about um, the driving and aging and complications that arise with aging and driving, how to stay uh, proactive on that and safe behind the wheel so that you're, you're not uh, putting yourself or other people, other drivers or, or pedestrians in danger as well. So a very important topic there. And as always, we do thank the Friends Foundation for the Aging for supporting our, our uh, programming efforts and allowing us to put on uh, these types of events and events like uh, the one you heard today. Um, but Matt, thank you so much for joining us. It was a wonderful presentation, uh, fantastic questions at the end and everything there. And, and thank you for showing all those pictures you've taken, the videos and everything as well. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Matt. And thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at uh, future events.